Let's bless his name together. Baruch Hu Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Ba'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. From Devarim Deuteronomy 6, the cornerstone of our faith. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praise be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah then said, the second command is like unto the first, v'yahavta l'recha kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to sing some songs of praise as we worship the Lord. This is a special day in a number of ways. One is that it is Veterans Day, but also a couple days ago, it was commemorating another time, Kristallnacht, the breaking of glass, and the beginning of one of the most devastating times in history, the Holocaust. And we're going to remember a number of things about that in relation to today's message, which is entitled Semper Fidelis Loyalty, Semper Fi. And we're going to be going into some detail with that. But there is something that we start with, and that is we have to follow somebody. And what we want to do is follow the Lord. But, you know, sometimes people will say they want to follow, and we'll be talking about that in the message a little bit, that they want to follow. I'll follow you wherever you go. And then the first inconvenience changes their commitment. And we're going to be looking at that today as to what it means to really be loyal and to experience what it is to care for one another. So we're going to begin with the song, Follow Me. <laughs> Follow me, follow me, just follow me, yes, follow me, greater love has no man than that he lay down his life for his friend, but you don't want to be inconvenienced for 20 minutes. Or even just ten. Think. 
think about it Then follow me Don't be discouraged Just follow me And I know you follow me By the love you show to one another They'll know you follow me By the way you care for each other Follow me Friends and your family And love with the same love that I love Towards your neighbor and your enemy Think about it Then follow me Don't be afraid now Just follow me same love that I love and do it over and over again it's love with the same love that I love and do it over and over and over and over and over and over again think about it and follow me Follow me by the love you show in every place you go. Just follow me, follow me, just follow me. Hashem. We have to follow him. Even when coughs break in and even when challenges come, we have to follow him. It's a funny thing that we want to follow, but we don't necessarily know when we commit to follow what the cost is. And when the cost gets too great, people dissipate. They disappear. And so we want to be able to stand strong. I mentioned before that it's Veterans Day, and on Thursday was Kristallnacht. And there was a place where, when you look at it, people said after the Holocaust, never again, never again. Only never again was a bit of inconvenience, isn't it? It's sort of like, oh, it's a shame it shouldn't happen, but hey, what can you do? That's not the same thing as never again. And so we're going to sing the song Crystal Night. Uh, it was inspired by a Holocaust friend of ours. And um, I said to her one day, as she described some of the events she went through, I said, that was like Kristallnacht. And she said, Kristallnacht happens every day. And we're living in a time when it seems like it's happening all over again. And we need to be strong and secure in what God has shown us to do. And so we're going to do this song, Crystal Night. Broken crystal, broken glass, dark haunting vision. That 
that never pass Broken hopes and shattered lives We suffered through the years, yet we survived Save us, O oh Lord, with your power and your might Raise us, O oh Lord, and bring deliverance in the night Lift us up, O oh Lord, from the places that we fall Save us, O oh Lord, and restore us to our call. Faded dreams of fragile heart, we need deliverance and a brand new start. Broken dreams restored again By the hand of God and not by man Save us, O oh Lord, come and make your presence known Raise us up, O oh Lord, and turn our heart into your home Save us, O oh Lord, let your healing rivers flow Raise us up, O oh Lord, restore our hearts Help us grow From a trail of tears A wounded soul Touched by your love Can be made whole With hope regained Our spirits rise Answered us, O oh Lord, and heard our cry When we said, save us, O oh Lord, from the terrors that we face Raise us up, O oh Lord, so our fears can be erased Save us, O oh Lord, so that we can clearly see Raise us up, O oh Lord, cause only you can set us free Yes, save us, O oh Lord, we put all our trust in you. Raise us up, O oh Lord, so that we can make it through. Save us, O oh Lord, but not just to survive. Raise us up, O oh Lord, so we can soar and learn to thrive. Yes, we can soar. And learn to thrive Praise the Lord. You know, today the big focus is how you can be a victim. A focus on being victims. God wants us to be victorious. He wants to overcome all those challenges and be able to go through and have hope that God is going to make a difference as we yield ourselves to him. And this is the difference. We can soar. God has so much that he wants to do if we will yield ourselves to him and let him be the one to give us all of that empowerment from on high. One of the things that we are called to, and it seems like war has been a focus these days, but, um, but we're talking about also veterans today. And all of those people who sacrificed to make a difference, all of those people who sacrificed for freedom, all the freedoms that we can experience are because of the sacrifice of people who put others before themselves. But we are in the midst of a dark time, and God wants us to shine with his brightness in the midst of not knowing what's going on around us. That can be very terror-filled. But God wants us to be a light and to let our light shine like the noonday as we yield ourselves to the Lord to reach those who are lost and those who are in need. And things we don't yet know Still into the night With all of our might we now go Oh, into the night With darkness and fear all around And into the night Uncertain of what will be found Oh, yes, and into the 
night, your unfiltered light will abound. And with the light of your power and grace, and in the light that shines from your face, oh, into the night, filled with your light we go. Yes, into the night, filled with your light we now go. And the darkness has to flee as your light sets people free and everyone will shine so bright like noonday in the night just like noonday in the night we go to set the captives free open the eyes that cannot see to bring about what soon must be like noonday in the night, we shine like noonday in the night. There is a lot of darkness around us, but God doesn't want us to fear. He wants us to generate that light that comes from Him so that people in darkness can see once again. We go to set the captives free, open the eyes that cannot see. Bring about what soon must be Like noonday in the night It's like noonday in the night Oh, come illuminate the night And shine like noonday in the night Restored by your great light Like noonday in the night Oh, come and bring your light So we can shine so bright like noonday in the night, just like noonday in the night. Oh, yes, and into the night, restored by your light, we now go. Baruch Hashem. That's what God wants to do. He wants us to bring us through the night to bring light to those who are in darkness and are having feelings of fear and trepidation, but God wants to set the captives free. And miraculously, he even wants to use us to do that, to be a light to the world around us. Shabbat Shalom, Sabbath peace to you. We have up here, we say deep thanks to all our veterans. Do we have veterans here today? We do. And we appreciate everything that you have done and the sacrifices that you've made and for the contribution that is so valuable for a free people. And we appreciate it greatly. And this is the time on Memorial Day, we, we remember those that didn't come back. But at this time, we remember those who carry the scars and carry all of the elements that came as a result of that. And I think at this time of year, we also think that, and we'll be talking about this a little bit in the message today also, but think about all the veterans that are living on the street abandoned. What happened to the commitment that was made? We need to be experiencing a loyalty to those who have paid very large price for our freedom. And anyway, our calling as a congregation is to declare Messiah to the Jewish heart of central Jersey and to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. By putting the message of Yeshua, of Messiah, back into the original Jewish context, what emerges is a revelation of incredible love that God has for the Jewish people and for all people. And we are grateful because it is the truth that Yeshua said will set people free. And we are grateful for an opportunity to declare Messiah, to speak from the rooftops, to speak from the housetops, to speak everywhere, and to share with commitment this message of life to all those who are walking in darkness and have no light. God wants to set people free. And when we share the truth of Yeshua in context, in its Jewish context, all the understanding of what Yeshua said 
comes with great power and with a great flow of incredible love that he wants to pour out. And we're grateful for all of that. And we want to be available for the Lord to use us to share this message with people everywhere, to go out into the highways and byways. You know, all these causes, people come and join causes and they don't even know what they're fighting for. It's amazing. But we know what we have in the Lord. And yet we sometimes keep silent. We need to raise our voices and raise our hearts to reach out to people who are looking for an answer that we have in Messiah. And we're so grateful for that. We have a basket in the back for Hamaser Vahatroma for the tenth, the tithes, and the offering. You can place that in there. There are envelopes if you need to fill that out. We also can receive from PayPal on our website at bethzion.org. And you can even mail it to Beth Zion, P.O. Box 807, Jackson, New Jersey, 08527. And we're grateful for everything that people do, for the way that people pray, for the way that they give and donate, and for the way that God is knitting us together as a people to have an impact in the communities around us. And we're grateful and looking forward to seeing what God is going to do. Avinu Malkeno, our Father and our King, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your word. We ask you to open up our hearts, open up our ears, to hear not words of man, but to hear what your Ruach, what your spirit would say to us. Speak from your spirit to our spirit. Make your presence known and give us deep understanding of what it is that you have called us to be involved in and how amazing the benefits of your kingdom are. And we ask you to pour your spirit out in a very special way in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, today's portion is entitled Hayesara, which is Sarah lived or Sarah's life. And it's taken from Bereshit, Genesis chapter 23, verse 1, where it says, Sarah lived to be 127 years old. These were the years of Sarah's life. And then it says Sarah died. But it's interesting that it starts off with Sarah lived. When it comes down to it, everything about our life is not when it ends, but what was accomplished in that life and what people did in sacrifice for others. We're calling this as a title for the message, Semper Fidelis Loyalty, Semper Fi, which is a marine statement that is made, which refers to a loyalty. It refers to the words in Latin, always faithful, always faithful. And what you find is a level of commitment to one another. When they make the statement, they won't leave any Marine behind. They won't leave any man behind. There is a commitment to one another that is there. And it carries over in the training and into battle and into every part of life. And it's significant that we are remembering Veterans Day. Because when we talk about loyalty and we talk about commitment, people have shown their commitment and shown their loyalty by putting their lives on the line for others to protect and defend people they will never meet, never know. We see stories of people in military operations where a grenade will come into the camp and somebody will leap onto that grenade knowing that it was going to end their life, but protecting the lives of those around them their comrades in arms. That's part of what Semper Fi represents, that there is a loyalty that's there. In fact, one of the things that I have here, it says, how is loyalty shown in real life or, or what is true loyalty? It says, loyalty means being there for someone through highs and lows, staying by their side regardless of circumstances, Loyalty involves accepting and loving someone 
for who they are and not threaten to leave them when things become challenging. Some common synonyms of loyalty are allegiance, devotion, fidelity, piety. Well, all these words mean faithfulness to something to which one is bound by pledge or duty. Loyalty implies a faithfulness that is steadfast in the face of any temptation to renounce, desert, or betray. And there is something so amazing, an eternal and collective commitment to the success of our battle. And you know, in life, we are involved in battle, whether you want to or not. You say, well, I'm a pacifist. But in life, we are involved in battles. It may not be on the battlefield. It may be that we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And God gives us victory over those. But we enter into those dark places, those places where we don't know what's going to be happening next. But we are not alone. Our commander in chief is with us. And I don't mean the president. God as our commander in chief. God as our general that lets us go forward and gives us victory as we yield ourselves to him. There are a number of things I want to look at a little differently in the light of this portion because when you talk about, I think it's significant, when you talk about Semper Fi, when you talk about loyalty, when you talk about an allegiance to one another and always faithful, I, I do think of this portion this week because what we are focusing on is the life of a person, what their life represented, what their life commitment was. And you know, when, when Sarah died, they owned nothing in the way of a land. And yet the promise to Abraham was that everywhere you look to the north, the south, east, and west will be yours. And here in this section, we find him purchasing the only piece of land that he actually owned. And that was for a grave site for his wife. And that was all he owned. And it's interesting, too, that in this section, there is this negotiation. And I find it interesting that people will make commitments and then they break them. But here they made a commitment. He purchased the land. You know, it's, it's sort of like an interesting dialogue, a Middle Eastern approach, uh, where it says in chapter 23, in verse 11, he says, listen to me. I'm giving you the field with its caves. I'm giving it to you. In the presence of, the, of my people, I give it to you. This is what this man Ephron said, the Hittite. And Abraham bowed before the people of the land and spoke to Ephron in their hearing. This kind of interesting dialogue going on. They have witnesses. Please be good enough to listen to me. I will pay the price of the field. Accept it from me, and I will bury my dead there. But Ephron answered Abraham, My Lord, listen to me. A plot of land worth 400 silver shekels. What is that between me and you? Just bury your dead. Avram got the point of what Ephron had said. So he weighed out for Ephron the amount of money he had specified in the presence of the sons of Het, 400 silver shekels of the weight accepted among merchants, 10 pounds. Sometimes people will make statements and say, look, what's money between us? What is it? Just bury it. Do what you, you know. But he said, what's 400 silver shekels? He was giving the price. But it was this negotiation kind of thing, like, look, between you and me, we're buddies, we're friends, everything's cool. But Abraham, just like it said earlier with when he went and rescued Lot, and the king of Sodom said, keep the spoil. He said, I won't let it be stated that you made Abraham rich. 
He trusted the Lord in all of this. And so here again, he meets out what the amount was. He made the purchase in the front of witnesses. Uh, I would say in some ways, Ephron was grandstanding a little bit and trying to show how gracious he was. But he was still negotiating and letting him know the amount. And Abraham paid it. Now, I find that interesting because sometimes in life, people tend to grandstand. They want to stand for a cause. They want to stand for some event or some issue. But when asked about what it means to them, they have no idea what the actual details are. There is no commitment that is there except as a body standing there to repeat whatever chance people are speaking from a loudspeaker or from a megaphone or whatever. But when we look at this, there is a lot that happens. What is most important with this section is chapter 24. Chapter 24 shows an honest level of commitment and loyalty like almost no other passages in the scripture. And that is where it says in chapter 24, verse 1, by now Abraham was old, advanced in years, and Hashem had blessed Abraham in everything. And he said to his servant who had served him the longest, Eliezer, who was in charge of all that he owned, put your hand under my thigh. He was basically dealing with addressing by the covenant of circumcision, by the covenant, he was saying, because I want you to swear by Hashem, God of heaven and God of earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from among the women of the Kenani, among whom I am living, but that you will go to my homeland, to my kinsmen, to choose a wife for my son, Yitzhak, Isaac. The servant replied, suppose the woman isn't willing to follow me to this land. Must I then bring your son back to the land from which you came? Avram said to him, see to it that you don't bring my son back there. Hashem, the God of heaven, who took me away from my father's house and away from the land I was born in, who spoke to me and swore to me, I will give this land to your descendants. He will send his angel ahead of you, and you are to bring a wife from my son from there. It's amazing because he goes forward. It says down a little bit, it says he said, Hashem, and this was so interesting, being raised in that family, part of that group that, that was Abraham's extended family in a sense, he said, Hashem, he prayed, God of my master, Avraham, please let me succeed today and show your grace to my master, Avraham. There was this incredible level of commitment that was there. And it's borne out in the things. You also begin to see why Abraham did not want Isaac to go back there. It took Abraham a long time to actually leave that place. The hold that people have on you, the hold that family has, all those ties, all those elements were working. And he understood that Isaac would probably not be able to handle the kind of pressure that somebody like Laban and others would put upon him. And he said, by no means, do not have him go back. And it says that he prayed Please let me succeed today and show your grace to my master, Avraham. There was an incredible amount of commitment. When it goes down to it, even when he had success happening, sometimes when success happens, we can become kind of casual with it. We can kind of relax a little bit. But he did not shift in any way from his commitment. And this is important because when we talk about being faithful, when we talk about always faithful, Semper Fi, we are talking about a commitment that no matter what, you are going to accomplish the task and you're not going to waste any time in the process. 
And so when it comes down to it, God blessed him and brought him all of the details. I won't go into all of it, but the woman comes out. She is from the same family, and, uh, and her brother Laban was there, and all of the different things that happened. And they said that uh, they welcomed him in, and at one point they offered a meal for food. And I find it so amazing because you think, well, something like you got to eat, you have to eat, right? But he was so focused that when it came to that, it says in verse 33, he said this. He said, but when a meal was set before him, he said, I won't eat until I say what I have to say. Laban said, speak. <laughs> you might talk. We want to eat, you know, talk. So he shared this with them. And all of this negotiation that was going on between, uh, between let her stay for a few days, a few months, let her, you know, get acclimated to the idea of leaving, all these different things that were stall tactics. What is amazing to me was that there was no room for negotiation. He said this, and that, that's why in verse 49 he says, so now if you people intend to show grace and truth to my master, tell me. But if not, tell me so that I can turn elsewhere and find what it is and who it is that God has for him, for Isaac. And it's interesting because when you take a strong stand based on the commitment that is there, the challengers back down. Laban and Betuel replied, since this comes from Hashem, we can't say anything to you, either good or bad. Let the girl decide. And she said, do you want to go? He says, I will. <laughs> she wanted out of there. And he said, when it says in the morning, they got up and he said, send me off to my master. Her brother and mother said, let the girl stay with us a few days, at least 10, a few days, at least 10. After that, she will go. He answered them, don't delay me since Hashem has made my trip successful, but let me go back to my master. And it's amazing because you would have thought, well, it's a long trip, I relax a little bit, I'll have something to eat, something to drink, spend a few days before we go back on this journey. It wasn't something that he could compromise on. He wanted success for his master. And so they leave and they go and all of this that unfolds, that follows. I want to look at a couple other things here because he is probably the epitome of a servant's heart. Putting his master's purpose before his own, putting someone else's purpose before their own. And so we're going to look at a few verses that uh, I've got a lot, but I'm just going to kind of whittle this down a little bit. I want to mention that in the Haftorah portion, just one quick reference, here you have an element of loyalty. You would say that David's Men were, his, were loyal to him and all of that. King David's men were loyal. They proved themselves loyal. They put themselves in harm's way. They did whatever it took. There was that time when he said, I'm thirsty. And one of the men broke through the lines, got water, came back, and he poured it out and said, I'm, he regretted even mentioning it because he did not want to put somebody in harm's way for his own needs. It, it, it's and, and then later, what you find in chapter one of first Kings, David was now old and getting ready to die. And Adonijah, his son, decides that who would be better to be king? I'm the second oldest after the one that was that was killed before Absalom was killed. And so he began to proclaim himself king. Now, what's interesting is that Joab or Joab, who was one of the commanders under King David, 
he changed his allegiance. He shifted. And he switched his loyalty from David, who now was old, to Adonijah, the new man on the block. And everything was celebrative and everything was going by. But at the same time, you had Abiathar, the Kohen, and Joab supporting Adonijah. But Sadok, the high priest, Nathan, the prophet, David's elite men and others expressed their loyalty to David. They expressed their loyalty to David and his choice of Solomon to be king after him. And so what is interesting is they negotiated, instead of approaching it just like what your son is doing and saying how wrong it is, they approached it in a calm, respectful way. They said, you made it known that Solomon would be king after you, but have you changed your mind because your other son is saying that he is the one now going to be in charge to follow you? And in the process, there was a rude awakening for him and his followers. And all of these people who were looking out for what was good to them, they shifted their loyalty once they saw the greener field on the other side. They were not aligned with Solomon at this point, but they were friends with the other son. They were aligned in that way, and they made it known. And we see all of this unfold, and we see how through this whole situation, God made a way for those who were loyal to the king to bring forth what had to happen to establish Solomon and then all these other things happened. You know, it's interesting that Joab, who had been loyal all those many decades, all of a sudden wasn't. And it's sort of like I think today when people talk about their loyalty to what God is doing in Israel. They're loyal until they're not. They're with them until they're not. A friend, a fly-by-night friend, is with you until they're not. And what we need to do is to understand what it means to have loyalty, not blind loyalty, but loyalty to a commitment and a covenant that is made for a purpose beyond ourselves. And so we see all of these things going on. There is in Proverbs 18, it says this, verse 24, some friends pretend to be friends, but a true friend sticks closer than a brother. A true friend will not back down because a scandal or something arises or words against them rise up. They stand with their friend. They stand with the one that they are loyal to. A friend is not a fly-by-night friend, but a commitment. Even if it goes through difficult times, they will go through the difficult times with him. They are not going to condone the bad things that the person may have done, but they're not going to shift their loyalty and their friendship. I think about with Nathan, how at one point in time, the prophet Nathan when David was doing something he shouldn't do, he got a man who was loyal to him, so loyal that even drunk, he would not sleep with his, with his own wife while the men on his command were in battle. And David used trickery. And so when he said to him, so even David, listen to that, this man who was so loyal and not knowing, he brought back his own death edict to, to this commander who said, bring him to the front by the wall and draw back the troops. Not only was he killed, but other people unrelated to it at all were killed as well. Innocent life. See, Nathan could speak to David, but he didn't go up to him and say, David, you're really wrong this time. You really got it all bad. You don't know what you're doing. You're messing up. It's a terrible travesty what you have done. And it was. 
But he didn't do that. He approached David in a way that a friend would approach him. And he said, I know your heart. He says, there is a man who has one lamb and another person who has a whole flock. And he took the man's one lamb and slaughtered it for people coming for dinner. David said, show me that man. Bring that man to me. He said, David, you are that man. Honesty, loyalty, commitment, fidelity, all of that was a part of him being able to speak into David's life, even though David had the capability of removing Nathan's life. But a friend sticks closer than a brother. A friend is there when the need arises. A friend can speak into a person's heart truth if that relationship is something that is established in the proper way. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You know, brothers may fight, but when it comes down to it, they will stand for each other and they won't let anyone come between them. And yet, here, we see all of these issues as a part of what it means to have commitment like this. I mentioned before, people stand with Israel. I stand with Israel until they don't. People say, never again, until they say, well, it's, uh, it's been a long time. It shifts again. There is something wrong. You know, People play on the emotions of people. People play on the emotions. You know, it was one point, interestingly, where Joab gave David friendly counsel that was right. When Absalom was killed and David began to mourn, he basically said, David, you can't do this. You are putting your dead son who was in rebellion against you and the nation above those who went in battle for you to preserve your kingship and the kingdom. And David responded properly. But later on, that one who had that loyal voice to speak to him there were indications along the way of his issues that were corrupt, Joab. But here he made a decision to shift loyalties. And it's sad because it didn't end well for him. When you look in the new covenant, it says we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. But look at Luke 9. Well, before we go to there, let me just mention another passage in Proverbs. Familiar passage. We know the passage that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your understanding. But it's interesting, the verse before that says, says this. Do not let grace and truth leave you. Grace and truth are elements that are a part of loyalty and faithfulness. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Then you will win favor and esteem in the sight of God and people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Don't be conceited about your own wisdom, but fear the Lord and turn from evil. This will bring health to your body and give strength to your bones. There is something very powerful when you talk about trusting in the Lord. One of the key characteristics of faithfulness is trust. It's faithfulness. It's commitment. And he's saying, don't let grace and truth leave you. How does it leave you? By making decisions that are coming from your own heart and not following through in the manner that God has laid out. In Luke 9... It's interesting here. We mentioned before, follow me, Yeshua says. In verse 57, Luke 9, it says, As they were traveling on the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Yeshua answered him, 
The foxes have holes and the birds flying about have nests, but the Son of Man has no rewards planned for the hotels he stays in, has no home of his own. To another he said, follow me. But the man replied, sir, first let me go away and bury my father. Yeshua said, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, sir. But first, let me go say goodbye to the people at home. To him, Yeshua said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and keeps looking back is fit to serve in the kingdom of God. Now, he's not being heartless. It's clear from this, his father, talking about burying his father first, his father was alive. There was no indication. He was saying, let me wait until my father dies, bury him, and then I'll follow you. Very convenient for you, but not for following Yeshua. When he says, let the dead bury the dead, proclaim, go and proclaim the kingdom. This is part of your allegiance, your commitment to experience what it is that's stirring your heart to follow now that has this overwhelming commitment that says, I will go wherever you go. I will follow you wherever you go. With a little clause. Unless it's inconvenient for me, and then I may adjust a little bit. You know, in that song I mentioned, Follow Me, and, and, and it says... You can't even follow for 20 minutes or even 10. It's amazing. People will lay their life down for somebody else, but they still refuse to be inconvenienced if something is important to them more so than the moment that is necessary for them to rise to the occasion. It says, no one putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit to serve in the kingdom. We looked just last week about the portion where Lot's wife looked back and was turned to a pillar of salt. She lingered too long, attached too much to what it was she was leaving. She could not let go to let God do what he was doing. It says in Matthew 27, where it talks about the encounter with Yehuda or Judas. It says, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Yeshua had been condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the head Kohanim and elders, saying, I sinned in betraying an innocent man to death. What is this to us? They answered. That's your problem. Hurling the pieces of silver into the sanctuary, he left. Then he went off and hung himself. When we talk about, last week we were talking about trauma. One of the things about Judas was he had done what he did and he may have had in his own mind reasonings that seemed correct at the time. He was in charge of the finances. He really had control in that way. And yet he betrayed an innocent man. He betrayed Messiah. And he understood at the time of the Seder that Yeshua understood what he was doing. And how did he betray him? With a kiss in the garden. And then he recognized it wasn't going the way he thought it would. His own way, instead of trusting in the Lord. And he didn't keep the money. The money was not the issue for him. But I thought it interesting that their response was, he said, I have sinned betraying an innocent man to death. Their response, what is that to us? That's your problem. 
And isn't that the way it always works when we go with our own instinct instead of doing what it is we had laid our life on the line to be committed to do? It never works the same way when we trust in ourselves instead of God. When we lean to our own understanding instead of walking into the valley of the shadow of death, walking through dark places that we don't know, but know that God is with us to carry us through to victory in the end. It is so amazing to see his response was a devastating one. He killed himself. Peter, who said, I will be with you to death if need be. He says, Kepha, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. Never happen. And in the process of his betrayal, the cock crowed and he was devastated. And yet he didn't go and kill himself. Later, Yeshua appeared to him and said, do you love me? He said, you know, I love you. And he said it three times and said, feed my sheep. When you are converted, when you are changed, you'll see it differently. And you can't see it when you're in the dark place. You can't make decisions in those dark places. We have to follow what the Lord says. And then there was an interesting thing, even with Peter again later in Galatians, where Paul was mentioning an encounter that he had with Peter who was compromising his calling. He was loyal to all the followers of Messiah. And yet he discovered that when he was with non-Jewish people, all of a sudden the group who were wanting to circumcise everyone Jewish or not Jewish, he kind of compromised a little bit. He acted like he didn't know them. He said they came, they they came surreptitiously to spy out the freedom we have in the Messiah Yeshua so that they might enslave us. Not even for a moment, verse five of chapter two of Galatians, not even for a moment did I give in to them so that the truth of the good news might be preserved for you. Verse 11, furthermore, when Kepha, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him publicly because he was clearly in the wrong. A friend can challenge a friend in love. A friend can question your motive and what you're doing. And he was uncomfortable, Peter, but he was grateful for it. Later, he says in another place in in one of his writings that Paul says things that are sometimes not understood by people, people who have no heart to understand. But he speaks truth. And it's amazing that we can speak into people's lives, even at a time when He had one of the people that were with him, Paul, who did not show loyalty at the moment, backed down and went away. Later on, you find him saying, when he comes, send the parchments with him. He didn't have an angst against him as a friend, and he was still loyal to him. But when it came to a decision that caused there to be compromise and confusion... He spoke the truth in love and said, you can't come on this. You can't be involved and severed that relationship from a mission standpoint. And yet later you see that there was no grudge against him. He was always there for him. A little bit further down in verse 21, it's very interesting. He says in verse 20, when the Messiah was executed on the stake as a criminal, I was too. Here he's describing what it is to be loyal and committed in a way that most of us don't fully comprehend. When the Messiah was executed on the stake as a criminal, I was too, so that my proud ego no longer lives 
But the Messiah lives in me, and the life I now live in my body, I live by the same trusting faithfulness that the Son of God had, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Another translation says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if the way in which one attains righteousness is through legalism, then the Messiah's death is pointless. How do you frustrate grace? You know how you frustrate grace? How you, re you, you reject God's gracious gift? You decide you can do it yourself. And in trying to do it yourself, you are challenging God's grace. You are challenging God's method for bringing about his purpose and plan. He says in Galatians 3, in Galatians 3, 3, here he's telling them, and you know, I love the fact that Paul is painfully honest with people, but showing it in love. He says to them, and imagine these words, you know, coming from Paul. Chapter 3, you stupid Galatians, who has put a spell on you? Before your very eyes, Yeshua the Messiah was clearly portrayed as having been put to death as a criminal. I want to know from you just this one thing. Did you receive the Spirit by legalistic observance of Torah commands or by trusting in what you heard and being faithful to it? Are you that stupid, verse 3, having begun in the Spirit's power? Do you think you can reach the goal under your own power? What a statement. But that is very powerful. It's God who makes the difference. A couple other passages, and then we're going to close. Romans 12. In verse 14, it says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And then there's this verse 16. Be sensitive to each other's needs. Don't think yourselves better than others, but make humble people your friends. Don't be conceited. Repay no evil for evil, but try to do what everyone regards as good. If possible, and that's an important word, if possible, and to the extent that it depends on you, live in peace with all people. Never seek revenge, my friends. Instead, leave that to God's anger, for in the Tanakh it is written, Hashem says, vengeance is my responsibility. I will repay. So you do things to assist your enemy from a humanitarian standpoint, but you also have a responsibility to the people that are in your charge to protect innocent life. He does end with this statement saying, do not conquer by evil, but conquer evil with good. And sometimes there are these times that are righteous times that we have to stand up. He says, husbands, love your wives as Messiah loved the congregations, Ephesians 5, 25, and gave himself up for her. Remember, it says also in the Torah, you shall have no other God before you. And when we put ourselves in our own point ahead of his, we are putting a different God on the throne. Just a couple quick verses. Colossians. He says, clothe yourself, verse 14, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. Remember, he says, you good and faithful servant. Faithful as you cause you also will do it. God is the one who is in charge. He says in Galatians 5.13, through love, serve one another. In Ephesians, he says, chapter 4, verse 2, always be humble, gentle, and patient, bearing with one another in love and making every effort to preserve the unity that the Spirit gives through the binding power of shalom, peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as when you were called, you were called to one hope. There is one Lord, one trust, one immersion, and one God, the Father of all, who rules over all, works through all, and is in all. God wants us to understand 
the commitment he made to us. While we were yet sinners, he laid his life down for us because he wanted us to experience the freedom that would come by forfeiting his own life, knowing that the Father would raise him up. And with that, he raises us up as well. We can't always tell in a circumstance what would be the best thing. But we need to trust the Lord and what he says in his word to be true. When he says that in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, then something like Kristallnacht has no place. It's shouting down the purpose of God. Anger and hatred fueling death to innocent life. We need to be able to do what God calls. Look how much God went in and told them, go in and destroy everything in that land. It was actually stronger than Israel's position. <laughs> Israel's position is that they try to make a way. Nobody has ever fought war like Israel has to make a way for innocent life to be out of the way so that they could deal with the enemy that's there. I mean, when they were bombing Dresden, when they dropped the atomic bomb on Japan's two cities, people over time said, yeah, what about innocent life? But nobody at the time said, are you trying to avoid civilian casualties? They saved hundreds of thousands of lives by ending the war in that moment, and the emperor surrendered. Germany had nowhere else to go. And all those people who were on the shores moving up and being shot as they were coming up because the vantage point was the enemy that was there, they took that place. They took victory at a very high price. Because the purpose and the plan was set there to bring freedom and liberty to people. You know, I, I thought of putting a meme up, but I decided at the moment not to do it because I know the kind of responses I'm going to get. But I wanted to say, I was thinking of saying, save Palestinian lives. Destroy Hamas. Because the real enemy of the Palestinian people are the leaders that keep them as a hostage, as targets, as human shields. And we need to be able to understand that we're to love our neighbor as ourself. But even in that passage, love your neighbor as yourselves, it says to be direct with your neighbor, to be frank with your neighbor, which means that if you have built a relationship that is sincere and honest, you can speak directly to situations and they will hopefully respond. But when everything is caught up in emotional whirlwinds, you know, I, I will say this. It was an interesting thing in the news. I don't know if I mentioned it the other day or if I mentioned it on the Zoom. But if I did mention it, forgive me for mentioning it again, but I thought it was an interesting insight. There was somebody who went around with a petition, and he said, we need to, would, would you sign this petition on college campus? Will you sign this petition to, uh, to liberate Palestine? And he said, yeah. And he says, okay, but you have to also sign these clauses. Well, what are the clauses? You're for beheading of innocent children. You're for the slaughter of families undefended. You are, and they said, well, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. I, I can't sign your petition. But it's interesting that as a petition, they were committing themselves to what they thought was an altruistic position. And yet when they saw the reality of what was happening, and when they asked people, do you know what happened on October 7th? And they said, they said, uh, I didn't hear anything about that. What was, you know, but they're there to support this position. 
for the Palestinian people. Israel is probably the only nation in that area that supports the Palestinian people. They support them with medication. They supported them when they gave them their own land and they pulled by force Israeli people out. Israelis fighting against the IDF to hold on to their land. And they took them out and said, this is your land now. They told them about the flower business and these other things that were there that they could make work. They destroyed them. They provided cement and all the different things for electricity and other things for structural things for the hospitals and schools and homes and all of that, roads and infrastructure. And the leaders poured every bit of that resource into building tunnels to kill Jews. Who is left holding the bag? The Palestinian people. You know, sadly, some of those people, some of the Jewish people that were killed who were on the other side, on the Israel side of Gaza, were some of the most quiet, peace-loving people. In fact, there was one man who was killed who his choice of job was to go into Gaza and take people who were ill and bring them to the hospitals in Israel so that they could be healed and be getting better accommodations. He was killed also. All of these people, they would hire people to work in their fields to do their different things. They would hire them. They had a relationship with people there. But the leadership had different things in mind. I'm not going to get political. But when we talk about Semper Fi loyalty, when we talk about being committed to a cause that is right and just, we have to understand the full parameters of those things. You know, when there are catastrophic events that happen in the world, whether it's earthquakes or floods or other things like that, Do you know which nation is the first nation there with their moving equipment and with people to be resources to assist people, even if they're countries that don't like them? It's Israel. Because their heart is to reach to the nations to assist wherever there is a need. But we don't hear those things these days because loyalties shift. And like I said before, people say, and I'll tell you, even with some of the politicians, they say, we're for Israel. Until we're not. We cannot live that way as God's people. We need to do what God says to do. We need to give a commitment to the Lord as he's committed to us and walk in that newness of life and of a heart to reach out to people outside, to be loyal to the people in need, walking in darkness and have no light, and be a light to those people, wherever that challenge may be. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, we thank you for all of these promises that are ours. This call that you laid out as an example for us with a loyalty that was unmatched anywhere, and that while we were yet rebels against you, you laid your life down for us. Lord, there are people who've laid their life down for strangers, laid their life down for family members, laid their life down even for enemies, but there has never been the kind of sacrifice that could have a ripple effect that could change people's lives like what you did for us while we were in rebellion against you. Thank you, Father, for sending Messiah. Thank you, Messiah, for laying your life down for us, rising again from the dead to make all grace to abound for whosoever will. Lord, we thank you. There's not a one-state solution or a two-state solution, but there is a one-God solution. And we use God's solution. It brings deliverance to all those in need. And we ask you to bring that to pass so that we can say, 
not just Sarah lived, but we lived and we did what you called us to do. Help us to walk in that place. We honor all the military that put their lives on the line. The Marines who said Semper Fi, who said hooah, hoorah. Different ones have those statements, and those statements are basically a commitment that says, I've got your back. I'm with you. We're in this together. And Lord, we want to be able to be in this with you, knowing that you will lead us and guide us into all truth. And we could see those in bondage, those in spiritual chains set free by the power of your spirit. In Yeshua's name. And as Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Sar Shalom, name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone agreed by saying amen and amen. Shabbat Shalom. Greet one another. Please join us afterwards at the Beth Zion House for uh, Onik Shabbat, for schmooze time, for talk time, and to celebrate together and to enjoy one another. And invite people out to synagogue, and we'll see you in shul. <laughs>